Hi, thank you so much for joining me for this session on bioinformatics with a focus on functional genomics analysis. My name is Jackson, and it's my great pleasure today to offer this webinar as an introduction to the field of computational biology, or also known as bioinformatics. The first part of today's webinar will be a very broad overview of bioinformatics, what it is, why it is important, and why it is rapidly gaining attention in many areas of biology, um, especially with regard to disease diagnostics, treatment, um, and research into disease mechanisms. But beyond that, um, bioinformatics really isn't just about um, analyzing data, you know, how to do uh, normalization of RNA-seq data or how to plot histograms in R. Um, to me, it is also about a new way of thinking that incorporates a data-driven mindset into research and uh, clinical practice and really just everyday life that I think will be uh, very helpful um, and that will shed new light on the many problems we face today in biology and medicine. Um, so the second part of today's webinar, which will actually take up the majority of the time, um, will be about an actual demonstration of uh, differential expression analysis um, in R on um, a data set that I uh, got from uh, online sources. And specifically, we'll be running differential expression analysis, um, which is a very common tool in bioinformatics, by the way, on microarray data, which uh, measures the mRNA expressions um, of, uh, in this case, um, experiment where the treatment uh, could produce uh, differential expression in genes um, in the two conditions. Um, and hopefully in this process, I'll be able to demonstrate to all of you that it's not all that intimidating um, to do bioinformatics. Um, and you, you actually can see it in uh, things that you've already studied before. Um, I think a lot of times people are often too quick to shy away from coding or uh, admit that they're not built for this. But um, the truth is, nobody really is born for coding because uh, by definition, it's a different language. Um, and just like learning any human language, uh, it does take time and practice. But um, the good news is it's, it's really not that hard. And you don't have to know all that much to uh, start having the ability to do bioinformatics and appreciate its power. All right. So um, what exactly is bioinformatics? Um, simply put, it's the union between biology and informatics. Um, and the way I think about this um, is that bioinformatics is to use the tools available in informatics to really understand um, biology, uh, be it you know, diseases or uh, many other areas of biology where bioinformatics can be applied. Um, and by informatics here, um, I'm mostly referring to, um, you know, algorithms and packages uh, that are available in R and Python, which, uh, by the way, are two of the mostly used programming languages uh, by bioinformaticians and are, uh, you know, pretty common to people working in the fields of computer science 
and statistics. Um, and uh, some of the newer developments in the field of informatics involves uh, many tools um, related to machine learning, um, which is different because it's focused on um, harnessing the power of artificial intelligence, um, and especially, and this is true, especially with regard to one branch of machine learning, um, unsupervised learning really focuses on um, having uh, the machine study uh, connections uh, within the data and uh, maybe tell us something that we were not able to see before. Um, and with regard to biology, um, usually um, we're not talking about um, biology um, at an in individual uh, level, meaning we're not talking about an animal, a plant, or maybe a fungus. Um, and instead, we're talking about data um, at the molecular level, and that mostly includes uh, genomics, uh, transcriptomics, and proteomics, uh, which correspond to obviously DNA, uh, mRNA, um, and uh, also other um, types of RNA and protein. And um, obviously, in recent years, as um, the importance of the epigenome uh, became uh, more widely recognized, um, sequencing of the epigenome. Um, it's also growing rapidly. Now, um, the rise of bioinformatics was really enabled by technological progress in both informatics and biology. Um, with, re with regard to biology, um, we have seen um, a revolution in sequencing technology that dramatically uh, improved uh, speed, accuracy, and low price. So we started with cellular sequencing in the 1970s and 80s, um, which allowed for the uh, sequencing of DNA um, for the first time in human history. Um, and this technology actually was used uh, in completing the Human Genome Project. Um, and then we saw the rise of um, uh, really a group of technology collectively known as um, the next generation sequencing technologies um, after the start of the century. Um, and this is a group of uh, methods such as pyro sequencing um, that was able to um, increase total amount of data output per run um, accuracy uh, by a lot and also uh, dramatically decrease the price. Uh, to give you an example, um, for sound sequencing technology, it used to take 15 years and greater than a million dollars for uh, sequencing uh, the human genome. And it only takes about two months. Um, and 10 grand for uh, sequencing the human genome now with uh, next generation sequencing. Um, at the same time, we're also, um, you know, the rise of bioinformatics was really also enabled by uh, progress in terms of computing power, um, the availability of personal computers, um, as well as new developments um, in um, informatics, you know, in machine learning techniques, uh, we're seeing a large variety of supervised and unsupervised models uh, being applied uh, in bioinformatics and uh, modeling, uh, mass mathematical modeling and physical, uh, biophysical modeling um, being applied in biology. And um, bioinformatics is such a powerful tool because it allows us to um, analyze vast amount of data that's already available, as well as you know uh, potentially a large amount of data that will become available in the future, to um, really zoom in 
um, onto the diseases at a molecular level to understand what exactly is going on um, at the molecular level and that eventually led to the onset of the disease. Um, as an example, um, phylogenetics, um, which I believe uh, people who had a background in biology might have seen it at some point in their life, um, such as this tree here, which is uh, commonly used to represent relationships among uh, different species or uh, among animals, plants, and uh, fungus. Um, but uh, phylogenetics actually has, um, which also have uh, a significant, a potentially significant application in understanding cancer biology. Um, because uh, many people believe that uh, cancer cells evolve um, in a clonal fashion, meaning they started out as a single clone. Um, now, um, on this example right here, let's say we have a patient with a primary tumor uh, in the liver and a metastatic tumor uh, in the lungs. And if we were to do uh, DNA sequencing of cells in both the primary site and uh, the metastatic site, we uh, can then uh, go on to run uh, phylogenetics uh, using you know, one of the three methods, uh, parsimony, uh, maximum likelihood, and distance trees, uh, to understand the relationships among oops, um, different cells um, in the primary site and in the metastatic site. And uh, in this example here, uh, we see that the blue cell here um, belongs to a different clone than um, the red cell here, which is also in the primary site, as well as the yellow cell and uh, orange cells um, in the metastatic site. Um, seeing that, um, we might then go on to ask the question, what exactly uh, led to the divergence um, or a, a branching of a, a different clone. Uh, maybe it was, uh, you know, maybe uh, this blue cell gained genes uh, in terms of mutations um, that increased its ab ability to migrate um, to different uh, parts of the body or um, maybe uh, gain uh, genes uh, or mutations that allowed them to become more aggressive. Um, and this way, we'll be able to reconstruct uh, the evolution of cancer cells or essentially disease progression um, in this hypothetical patient. Now, um, I want to talk about a second example um, of using uh, a differential gene expression um, analysis and um, which is oftentimes followed by uh, a network analysis. Um, in this example here, um, we have um, essentially um, subtypes of breast cancer um, versus normal uh, sam uh, sample here. Um, and by doing a differential expression analysis um, on um, samples of subtypes of breast cancer versus normal on uh, each of the row here is um, a gene, um, we will be able to see how exactly our uh, subtypes of breast cancer different from uh, normal samples. Um, and by doing this, we will be, uh, among many other things, be able to figure out uh, potential targets uh, for treatment. Uh, for example, we can clearly see that Lumina A and B subtypes of breast cancer um, have an upregulation, which is represented by the color red here, um, in this group of genes um, as compared to the normal sample here, which is uh, down uh, as represented by the color green. Um, and this group of genes, uh, some of them could be potential drivers uh, 
for uh, breast cancer um, that cause the differences in expression we're seeing here. Um, and following um, a differential gene expression analysis, we might uh, want to do a network biology analysis where we um, identify all the genes that are significantly uh, differently expressed and then um, try to understand their relationships amongst each other. Um, in this figure here, for example, um, we can see um, some of the genes that have connections to um, a group of other genes. Uh, for example, this uh, red gene here that I can't see very well, but it's connected to a very large number of gray genes uh, up and down. And this indicates that uh, this gene over here could potentially be very important um, in you know explaining maybe uh, the phenotypic differences between having a subtype of cancer uh, versus uh, normal. Now, um, before we get started on the uh, actual coding practice today, I just want to go over some basic concepts of our coding with you. Uh, that you will see over and over again um, in the practice today. Um, so first of all, um, there are four uh, common data types in R. Uh, uh, first of all, we have uh, a Boolean, which is uh, which only takes on the value of true or false, um, which is very helpful because a lot of times we um, don't want our program to run all the time. You know, we might uh, want it to run only when uh, specific conditions are met. Um, and then we have numbers, uh, which uh, includes uh, integers, which are whole numbers, and doubles, which are numbers with decimal points. Um, but uh, and this uh, distinction between integers and doubles uh, isn't uh, particularly relevant to um, our practice today, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, we also have a data frame or matrices, which uh, basically looks like this, uh, which is really helpful, or I should say important in R, because a lot of data we, uh, data we analyze uh, will be in this format, and actually uh, the expression uh, data set we will be analyzing today will also take on this uh, rows uh, by columns uh, format. And in this case, we might have uh, different probes uh, in the microarray as rows, and then we might have um, uh, samples as columns. Um, and finally, we have uh, characters, which are also known as strings, uh, which is basically um, uh, just words uh, in English. Uh, um, and then uh, another very important concept in R coding is that of objects. Um, so an object is basically something that contains data. And it could be as simple as uh, given in this example here, uh, in the, uh, this uppercase A is an object um, uh, where we are assigning a value of 3 to it. Um, and this error sign here, by the way, which uh, you might see quite a bit in R coding, is uh, equivalent to the equal sign. It's just a convention of saying we're assigning the value of 3 to uh, this object of uppercase A. Um, or um, objects uh, could be quite complicated. Um, you know, it, it could be something a pre, it might be a predefined data type, uh, such as expression set object, um, which, by the way, is actually something we will be using today. Um, and in this case, an o this object might contain multiple layers of information. Uh, it, it might include uh, expression values from um, the microarray we ran. Uh, it might include uh, experimental information, you know, what uh, sound line we use, uh, and uh, sample information. Um, 
And then we have uh, functions uh, which are essentially the doers in R uh, that carry out what you want to do. And again, it could be uh, as simple as the sum function here, which adds up 2 and 5, and which will output 7. Um, or it could be a, a bit more complicated, such as uh, the hits function here, which uh, plots a histogram for you in R. Um, and for uh, these uh, more complicated functions, you often might have a set of parameters here as showing uh, as shown in um, the brackets, um, which uh, specifies exactly how you want your histogram plotted in R. Um, and, and these will be uh, on an uh, a individual basis to uh, each function. So uh, I will talk about them on a case-by-case -case basis. And finally, we have uh, packages or libraries uh, which uh, contain uh, custom functions uh, or data. Um, and a lot of the functions we'll be using today are custom functions. So you do have to import uh, the relevant libraries before uh, getting access to them. Or uh, you know, a library might contain data uh, and in today's example, it might contain annotation data, uh, mapping uh, probes uh, in the microarray to uh, genes. Now, um, let's get started on the actual differential expression analysis. Um, so the data set we'll be using uh, this 3483 dataset is available on something called um, Array Express, um, which is um, an online repository of uh, functional genomics data, um, or you know RNA data, um, and it really is a uh, a great uh, tool because it allows you to get access on uh, a vast amount of data that you can just import uh, in R um, and analyze on your own. Uh, and uh, this is uh, you know accessible to the entire public, uh, so you might want to uh, take a look at this uh, database in the future. Um, now, uh, the data set we'll be looking at specifically is uh, this 3483 data set on uh, gene expression analysis of PANC1, which is a pancreatic cell, uh, cancer cell line, uh, with uh, either control or ZAP1 knockdown. Um, just to give you a bit more background on this, or you know, obviously you can also take a look at it, uh, the description here. Uh, on Array Express. Um, uh, this is an experiment about EMT or epithelial to mesenchymal transition, um, which is an important process in cancer um, allowing uh, epithelial cells um, to uh, transition into a uh, more mesenchymal uh, phenotype and um, gain uh, a variety of traits that allow these cancer cells to be uh, basically more aggressive, uh, invasive, and so on and so forth uh, in this process. Um, so this experiment is trying to determine basically uh, whether if you knock down uh, ZAB1, um, which is an important EMT activator, a crucial EMT activator, um, the effect of that uh, treatment on gene expression. Um, so uh, if we click on uh, detailed sample information here, we will see that there are four samples, and then two of them are controls, and two of them are ZAP1 knockdown. Um, and then, um, in terms of the methods, um, the code I uh, have prepared for today 
it's based on uh, a combination of uh, the majority of it is based on a workflow developed by uh, these two German researchers um, as part of uh, the bioconductor uh, project, which uh, is a project that has resulted a uh, a lot of open source uh, packages um, and uh, articles uh, in R that uh, you know basically tells you uh, how to do bioinformatics, and it's uh, a very uh, useful tool for. Uh, everybody in the bioinformatics community uh, to, um, you know, uh, work together and figure out how to do uh, differential expression analysis, but also a variety of um, other analysis on, um, uh, you know, genomic data, RNA data, and so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, part of my code is also based on uh, the Lima package in R, which is also a bioconductor package um, and which will be loading to R today. Now um, some final words of caution before we um, pull up the R Studio window is that um, this webinar is really meant to be um, a very basic introduction on bioinformatics and differential expression analysis. So um, the data that I chose um, reflects that goal because it really is uh, very simple in a lot of ways. Um, for example, it only has um, four samples um, and one independent variable feature. Um, and as a result of that, we will not be getting into um, many of the challenges that will arise once you get started on um, analyzing more complicated um, and advanced data sets. Um, for example, uh, we will not be dealing with the problem of potentially having uh, too many samples um, or having more than one uh, independent variables or features um, or having to compare across um, uh, arrays on different platforms. Um, for example, if you're trying to uh, compare expression results on an FE matrix chip uh, to the expression results on an, a brain array chip. Um, so on a related note, um, because of the limitations that I just talked about, um, you might want to be careful uh, in uh, looking at the data set uh, before you try to apply uh, what I will be talking about uh, in a minute. Um, and uh, this method uh, that I will introduce um, is uh, pretty much applicable to um, only to the most basic um, uh, data sets if, if you want to copy everything from, from my code. Um, that's because um, there will be um, a lot of a lot more uh, you know quality control and uh, normalization and things like that. Uh, to be done, uh, let's say, for example, if you uh, want to look at a data set um, with um, uh, more than one independent variable, um, which is the case for uh, the data set used by uh, these two German researchers in demonstrating their workflow. Now, um, the first thing you need to do um, however, for today, um, is to first download um, R Studio, um, which is a software that will uh, allow you to run R uh, programming in it. Um, and um, it's, it should be pretty straightforward. You just you know search for it on Google, and then. Uh, Download the uh, version for your computer, whether that's going to be a Mac or a PC. Uh, it's completely free, um, so you would just hit download and then install it on, on your computer, um, which is something that I have already done, um, so I will not um, repeat it up here.
So um, it will look something like this once you uh, open it. Um, and um, first thing you will do is to uh, select our studio and then go to file, which is actually not showing on the screen. Uh, but go to new file and then our markdown to uh, open up a new uh, file to uh, where you will write your code. Um, and you can also name your uh, file up here um, um, for the title. Um, once you've done that, um, the next thing you need to do is to install the relevant packages um, for the method that I will be describing now. Um, so first of all, um, I have already listed um, all the packages that you will need um, up here. Um, and for these packages, they are bioconductor packages. So um, you uh, the, the installment uh, in, installation of those packages might be a little bit different. Um, so you will have to uh, search, uh, for example, search for Array Express bioconductor package on Google and then um, you should be able to find something uh, like this um, which is a page on the bioconductor uh, project telling you how to install the package in R and what you will do is to copy uh, this entire thing right here and then paste it into R and then um, run these lines by going to run run selected lines. Um, or uh, if you don't want to do that, uh, a shortcut is to just highlight the lines you want to run and then hit command and um, enter. Um, now I have already installed these packages so I won't repeat it here. Um, and for these packages, they are base packages uh, already available in R. So to install them, you will go to uh, Packages down here, Install, and then type your package name, and then hit Install. Um, and I've already installed them as well, so I will also not repeat it here. Uh, now, um, before we start coding, I just want to uh, give a very brief description on uh, the setup of uh, this environment. So you have uh, this area in gray here where you will uh, write all your code. Um, so let's say I'm writing print hello world. Um, and I hit command enter. Um, you will see the output of your uh, code down here in the console. And this is the output of uh, the line that I just ran. Um, now we also have the environment here, which will populate once you start. Um, you know, creating objects or like uh, importing data sets. Um, and then down here you have a few tabs to, you know, install packages and things like that. Now, um, the uh, thing that I will do first is to um, load all the packages that I will need for my um, uh, code here. Um, so the way to do that is to type library and then the package name you want to load. Um, and then um, this is just a few lines for uh, installing the bioconductor package for a previous version of R. Um, and um, loading these two packages as well. Alright, so first step. Um, 
is to import data from ArrayExpress, which, um, like I previous, uh, previously mentioned, is the repository where all the data is stored. Um, and to do that, we need to specify a path um, or uh, where the downloaded data will be stored. Uh, so let's initialize um, uh, you, uh, this path with uh, temp a temporary directory uh, over here. And then we will use uh, the get AE function to um, extract the, um, the data set that we'll be analyzing today. And uh, you want to insert uh, the name of um, the data set um, uh, in here, and then pass is where you will store your data set, which we have initialized over here. Um, and then you run uh, this line. So this process is going to take a while um, as uh, the code extracts uh, files from the data uh, from ArrayExpress. Um, and actually, um, while this function is used to extract the data, um, the output of um, this getAE function uh, over here will actually be a name, uh, uh, sorry, a list of names of files that we uh, download. Um, so I name it uh, file names AE. And um, and by the way, um, all the data sets in ArrayExpress are stored uh, in the image tab format, uh, and that's why it started with uh, EMTAB. I suspected, um, and. Uh, this data format contains, uh, among them, uh, SDRF uh, data that we will need uh, to create an expression set object that will be the input for a variety um, of the functions that I uh, that we will be using today for uh, the differential expression analysis. All right, so um, over here, um, uh, these SDRF files contain information uh, with regard to uh, sam uh, the samples of the experiment, um, you know, what exactly is in the sample. Um, so let's get these files out first. Um, so first you want to specify, again, the path where uh, you will be able to find the SDRF file um, by doing file.pass and then this is um, the pass where you stored um, all of the uh, data files uh, pertaining to this 3483 data set and then this is uh, the SDRF.txt um, file that you want or I should say the pass of the file that you want. Um, and actually, um, you will you can see um, say file name AE, and uh, you can find it right here uh, the path of the SDR file uh, within the original path of all the files you downloaded, and then we read uh, this text file by uh, doing uh, using this function right here, which reads text files. Um, and um, before we uh, continue, let's take a quick look at uh, the SDR file that we just um, extracted from the, uh, the directory. So let's say um, SDRF matrix equals as dot matrix 
SPLS. Now we can see um, this SDRF file we just down, download or extracted uh, rather from the directory uh, contains all the sample information here. So we have four samples, and they're all uh, human cells, and actually all PANC1, which uh, is a pancreatic cancer cell line. Um, and we can see over here. Um, uh, information about treatment applied to uh, each sample in um, actually in a variety of locations um, uh, you know array.data file you can see these two are controls these two are Z1 knockdowns um, so let's name um, uh, the rows of the SDR file as uh, SDRF dollar sign. Uh, this is used to basically pull out um, all the information in the row name array.data.file. And um, if you do it right here, SDRF dollar sign, you can uh, extract information um, in that row called array.data.file. right here um, and then let's convert this um, SDRF file um, into uh, a different data format um, so uh, we can incorporate that into the expression set object that we will be creating so then um, this is a really important step in this process um, is to create um, an expression set object, um, which I name express set here. Um, so this object is um, a predefined object containing um, essay data, which is a microarray expression data um, that again um, is temporarily stored in um, the paths we uh, specified earlier, um, as well as uh, uh, phenol data, um, which uh, is essentially information um, covered by the SDRF file, and then we will also have feature data um, stored. Um, so, and the other thing that I want to mention, um, which we'll see uh, later, is that um, because this uh, expression set object has many layers of information, you know, assay data, phenol data, uh, we will need to um, use uh, functions to call, um, uh, to, to rather to extract these um, uh, different layers of data when we need them. Uh, and uh, we will talk about that later as we move on. Um, so here uh, is the step to create uh, expression set object um, and this is just telling you that this read.cell file function um, was from the legal uh, package that we um, in loaded uh, at the very beginning um, so um, you do file names and then you specify file.path um, and then this is uh, telling uh, this function to load um, files in the order uh, that we specified for the SDR file. Um, and then we uh, specify the SDR file will be um, loaded into phenol data. Then we want to check whether this express that object is valid or not. And then uh, we will run a very quick quality control uh, to see um, the expression values that uh, in the ex express that object that we just created and see whether we are uh, having any anomalies in uh, expression values. So um, here we want to convert it 
to a log scale first, which uh, is the convention uh, in bioinformatics. So we do log two um, express uh, and then express set. And by the way, this is the function that I just talked about, which uh, is used to extract all the assay data stored uh, in this express set expression uh, set object. And then we do a, a box plot of uh, the log transformed uh, expression set that we uh, just created. And then uh, you know this parameter is just saying we want uh, the name of the plot to be box plot of log two intensities for the raw data. And uh, now scrolling down, we see this um, box plot of log to transform aggregate intensity for um, each array uh, in this data set. And actually, we can see um, the aggregate intensities are quite consistent across the data set, which is good. Um, but um, the reason why uh, we're doing this is because sometimes we might see uh, medium aggregate intensity, uh, for example, that's over here, which uh, could be concerning because um, if in this case, you know, such as this case, um, it deviates significantly from the rest of the group, then um, it could potentially be pointing to um, uh, problems such as uh, non-specific binding uh, in this array, or maybe uh, uh, you know problems in the processing of um, the sample uh, in this case, and we might want to get rid of uh, the sample altogether if that actually happens. Um, now, what we just did was essentially to look at this problem of. Um, uh, aggregate intensity uh, that deviates from uh, the rest of the group from a qualitative uh, perspective. Uh, but we also need to uh, look at this issue from a more quantitative perspective. And specifically, we'll have to run the relative log expression analysis here. Um, so uh, we would first get started by running uh, the RMA function, uh, which I will actually talk about it a bit more later uh, here, but without the normalization. Um, and then we will uh, look at um, aggregate um, intensity, um, uh, look at the deviation of aggregate intensities from uh, the median uh, of this entire data set. So uh, the way we do this is we're going to calculate uh, row medians for um, each row or each probe um, in this data set, and then uh, such as we uh, what we're doing right here, and then we will subtract the medians from um, all the expression values um, in the data set. Now we convert it to a data frame. Uh, do a little bit of mapping, and then plot it uh, using the ggplot function. And then we scroll down to the bottom of the code where um, all the generated figures will be. And again, we can see uh, something that's consistent w with what we saw in the box plot earlier, uh, which is saying that um, aggregate intensities for um, samples uh, in this data set um, are pretty consistent. So we don't actually have to get rid of anything. But uh, let's say uh, the uh, aggregate intensity for uh, this sample is over here, then uh, we might want to get rid of it because it's significantly um, different from zero. Um, now, Next step in the process, we will actually run uh, the full uh, RMA uh, normalization um, to um, adjust for 
uh, deviations in uh, aggregate intensity of other probes. And then we will do a probe filtration to get rid of probes uh, that have uh, low medium intensity. So we plot a histogram of um, the row medians. Um, and uh, let's get a, a general picture first. And we can see here a distribution of uh, the media intensities for all the probes. Um, so the way we want to do this is that we want to set a manual threshold somewhere to the left of this peak over here to uh, not get rid of too many probes um, and um, el eliminate anything that has um, an intensity that's below the threshold we're going to set. Um, now because um, we can't actually see what's going on between 0 and 2, uh, where the peak is actually centered, uh, we want to zoom in a bit on this histogram. So let's set um, the limit of x coordinates to one uh, between one and two, and then run the histogram again. Now we can see more clearly that the peak is probably somewhere between one point four and one point six. Um, so I'm just going to say um, the manual threshold I want in this case is 1.4. Now um, we want to um, keep only a probe um, if the number of expression values greater than the manual threshold we set um, is equal to or greater than the uh, number of samples in the smallest experimental group, uh, in which case it's two. So um, we run this, and um, we use the subset function to keep, well actually we're running this function here to get an index of the probes we want to keep, and then we use the subset function to only keep those probes in uh, the E set, and now uh, we move on to annotation. Well, so uh, apologies here actually uh, because I uh, actually forgot to uh, load uh, this includes package right here uh, that will be needed um, at the very beginning of um, this coding uh, practice. So um, I just want to load the library here, uh, which you might have to install uh, uh, using the uh, uh, previous method I talked about about uh, regarding installing bioconductor, pi bioconductor packages. Um, and now we will uh, use the select function to um, annotate um, this ESA we have using uh, probe IDs, um, and we're using uh, feature names uh, ESA to get the keys which are probe IDs, and then we specify we will be matching by probe ID, um, and here we have um, the library containing uh, the relevant annotation information, and the columns specify what information uh, we want to extract, in this case we want to extract information on uh, gene symbols and uh, uh, gene descriptions. Um, and uh, we get rid of anything uh, that doesn't have a gene symbol. Now we group the uh, annotation of the ESAT by the probe ID and we do a summary um, of the anode group object by uh, the number of matches, um, which is necessary because it turns out that um, a probe can be matched to uh, different genes um, in this data set. 
and we need to get rid of the, uh, these probes with uh, ambiguous uh, matching to gene symbols. So uh, let's take a quick look at the NO summarize object we just created. Uh, on the left side, we have probe ID, and then we have number of matches. And for example, uh, this first probe here uh, matches to two genes, so we do need to get rid of it. Um, so we will uh, filter uh, the NO summarize, and then we will have. Um, a list of uh, genes to be ex excluded with number of matches greater than one um, and then we are just um, passing this to a uh, different uh, object here and then we find the indexes to exclude uh, in the E set by finding uh, the overlap uh, of feature names E set, which will be uh, the probe IDs, and then the probe ID column from this uh, object we previously created, and then we use the subset function to um, get um, uh, get rid of these uh, uh, probes from the E set. Now, um, this is the final step of um, this analysis, which is the actual uh, differential expression analysis part where um, a differential analysis will be performed using uh, the Lima package uh, using a linear model to fit the data. Um, now the details of the uh, linear model is beyond the scope of this webinar, um, but it's important to know that it is um, a linear model uh, used to fit data, and I will uh, focus in instead on um, interpretation of the results. So first of all, we need to construct um, a uh, design matrix. Um, so And let's assign some row names and column names. Now, this design matrix uh, needs to be in this format. Um, and in this case, since we only have one independent variable, the rows will be uh, samples. And then the first column should be the control. Um, and then the second column should be um, the uh, the treatment, and then if there's a zero, it means that uh, these two first uh, two first samples are controls, um, and then uh, the there are two ones here because these are the uh, two treatment samples. Um, so the way to think about this is that sometimes this uh, column is referred to as the intercept, and you can think of it as that we're starting with um, um, a f uh, control, and then based on whether uh, the samples are actual controls or not, we are adding on top of um, the intercept a value assigned to whether it being um, a control uh, zero in this case uh, versus uh, a treatment. Or one. Now uh, we load the package Lima and then we need to calculate the linear fit, fit uh, based on the ESAT and the design matrix and then we perform, uh, we calculate T statistics um, for uh, the fit and then we get the results by calling the top table function uh, based on the fit um, and coefficient here, which is referring to um, the uh, second column here in the design matrix, uh, SH sub 1, and then we need to adjust the results 
uh, using the BH adjustment uh, for t test uh, t statistics. Now um, let's take a look at the results here. So um, the uh, this differential expressions uh, analysis uh, will basically yield results that are similar to the results of a t-test. Um, so here uh, you can see the p-value, which is uh, the alpha or uh, type 1 error, uh, if you're familiar with hypothesis testing. But this is basically saying um, that the probability of um, you making a mistake um, uh, in seeing a significant result, uh, in this case a significantly uh, differentially expressed gene, while um, in reality there's uh, no such significance um, is uh, 2.915 times 10 to the negative uh, 6. Uh, power. Um, and we also have the adjusted p-value here uh, because we do need to account for multiple testing. Um, so this is the adjusted p-value after performing the BH adjustment. Now um, we usually want um, adjusted p to be less than 0.05 um, but you know, since this is just a demonstration of how to do uh, differential expression, uh, let's say we want to be uh, more liberal uh, in our adjusted p uh, threshold, and we want to be as comprehensive as possible to include all the possible differentially expressed genes. We might set uh, something like an adjusted p of 0.2. And let's say we do that. Uh, we will need to subset the results by um, uh, adjusted p less than 0.2 and then we will uh, run a few more lines to uh, match the uh, probe IDs um, that we have in results to actual genes um, um, using the uh, annotation set that we created earlier and we will arrive at um, our list of significant genes. Now, um, so in the context of, of this experiment, uh, we will say that um, the knockdown produced uh, or resulted in downstream change uh, in mRNA expression levels for these particular genes. Um, now, um, one of the, uh, you can do a number of things actually with uh, this list of significantly expressed genes, but one of the more uh, common ways people might uh, try to do after you get this gene list is to run a pathway analysis to make sense of uh, what this list of genes actually means. And um, there are a number of uh, online platforms that would allow you to do pathway analyses. Uh, one of them is called Gorilla, uh, which is a platform allowing uh, pathway analysis based on gene ontology or Go terms. And let's say uh, your list of significant genes resulted uh, in significant enrichment of the goal term um, of, uh, let's say, uh, aggressiveness in cancer. It's just something I made up. Um, in that case, uh, it would indicate that your knockdown uh, changed uh, the uh, aggressiveness of cells um, compared to your control condition. All right, um, so it seems like we're already running out of time. Um, that will be everything I have for today's uh, webinar on bioinformatics. Um, hopefully it has been useful, and I just want to thank you all again for joining me today.